And thank you again so much for inviting me. And good morning again. I was here a few weeks ago for um, Inter Sangha ethics, Buddhist ethics training. And I was just so struck by <clears throat> how beautiful the building is and, and the lake. Um, and I do like to start by acknowledging that we are on the shore of Nurutapi today, but just as beautiful Bidemakaska <clears throat> on the Dakota and Anishinaabe homeland. Um, so this morning, I like to share <clears throat> with you what has been alive and fresh in my mind, some of my musings. <clears throat> and um, I don't have any answers, sorry, but I hope uh, my sharing um, inspires some inquiry in all of us. <clears throat> and a little warning that some of the things I'm going to share are hard things. So I invite you to remember to breathe and help your body stay relaxed. <clears throat> the world around us is changing and with increasing uncertainty. And some people would say with disintegration. <clears throat> so we live in a troubled and troubling world. Whether we are aware of it or not, the body receives the impact of such world. But our attitude is shaped by the modern Western view that separates body and the mind. <clears throat> that objectify nature as if we are not of it. The view divides and hierarchizes nature, where human beings at the top of the pyramid, supposedly in control of the rest. Such delusion that we we have held so so long and so dear. The theory of evolution taught survival of the fittest, giving credence to the primacy of force of strength as a way for survival. <clears throat> These notions of separateness and power over have resulted in so much suffering and destruction. How do we heal these divides? I think I and many of us have been asking. <clears throat> How do we <laughs> challenging, <clears throat> challenging. All right. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. So, how do we vision a new without having to use the same old tool that built the house of suffering and separation? When our hearts respond to all this with a tremor, what does it ask of us? Our habitual way of viewing the world obscures the depth and breadth of reality and keep, it keeps us stuck in the cycle of suffering and harm. Of course, this is not a new idea to you, to me, to any student of the Dharma, right? 
And what is fresh in my mind these days are recurring, sobering reminders of the extent to which our view of reality is conditioned by the prevailing culture, the limitation of the language, and by one's social and actual physical location. So some of our habitual conditions and reflexivity are hard to see by ourselves, like trying to see the back of our head. Most of the time we are looking at object as our projections, actually, and not really the way things are. Most of the time we are touching a part of an elephant in the dark and making stories about its hole. We really need each other to help us see things as they are beyond our mind's projections. This is one of our awakening work, right? <clears throat> so for example, I've been thinking about something so simple and seemingly benign like the use of the word we. I have reflected on how the word that's meant to include and create a sense of togetherness could actually exclude some people and cause harm. In predominantly white, cisgender, able-bodied space, and I'm assuming this is one of those, <coughs> speakers' lack of appreciation of the diversity and historical and current inequity harm those who do not fit in those categories, white, cisgender, able-bodied, and so on. So the speaker needs to own their own location within the scope of the diversity and equity. And their speech needs to reflect that. Now, in just a couple of minutes that I've been speaking, since I began, I've already used the word we or us at least half a dozen times. When I said we, or us this morning so far. Did you feel any dissonance or discomfort? <clears throat> I say we, and most of you who are white probably felt no dissonance. And you probably felt included by my use of the word we. I purposely said we instead of you separating you from, from I. <clears throat> In terms of race, it's implicit that this we is white. When a person of color addresses predominantly white people, the word we become nuanced and complex in certain contexts. As a person of color, I bring my racial awareness to a public space. Were you, in a, were, were you aware of your white body when you entered the Zendo this morning? Did you think about that? If you're Black, Indigenous, or a person of color, it's more likely that you reflexively check for other people of color in the space, something most white people don't have a need to do. When we say we, who are we really including? And does our ignorance or privilege unintentionally exclude some people? I remember a Dharma talk in which a teacher talked on our blindness as a metaphor of our ignorance, which we do all the time. I was blind to this and that. And at the end, a student raised her hand and with a quivering voice shared her pain in, in listening to that talk. She was vision impaired. She was blind and this is not necessarily ignorant. And that 
really stayed with me. So in my sharing this morning, by my use of the word we, if any of you feel ex excluded or harmed, I, I would like to ask for your forgiveness and I would like you to let me know. <clears throat> well, let me share some more musings. We like to think we know so much. And if we are lucky, one of the things we would or should know is how little you know. Let's bring our attention to something so close and immediate, like this body. Do you know how many cells you have in your body and what each is doing right now? <laughs> and it's inside of us, it's happening right now. It's estimated that there are about 37 trillion cells in an average adult body. Even as I speak, even as I speak right now, some cells are being regenerated and some are dying. And each cell communicates with others self-organizing and is doing its own thing to keep the body functioning. That's why we are alive. And when you're asked about ourselves, did you happen to remember that each of our body, every single one of us, <clears throat> started as one cell that became 37 trillion Cells. How does our heart respond when it hears this story? <clears throat> or let's go far, far out into the galaxies. Do you know <clears throat> where your earthly home is located in the universe? Our home is on the land known as Minnesota that is on the continent of North America, on the planet Earth. And the, the Earth is between Venus and Mars in the solar system. That is, the solar system in it, the Earth is about halfway between the center and the outer edge of the Milky Way galaxy. We are alive this moment in our home planet in the universe with estimated 200 billion galaxies. What does this story do to our perspective on time and space and who we are? <clears throat> Let's breathe through this story. <clears throat> Do you know who your ancestors are? We are here, every single one of us, we are here because of them. Our physical existence is a result of an unfathomably long lineages, uninterrupted lineages, the cycles of life. It's no small matter that you and I are here, that the earth supports this kind of existence. And so, because of that, we can walk on the path of Bodhisattva Vah and we can aspire for liberation. And do you know what we expect to happen the rest of the day today? Do you think it's going to unfold in, in, the unex, in, in your expected way? Do we leave a space in our mind and heart for an unexpected contingency that might change us forever today?
It's astounding how little we know. Yet life unfolds with some measure of order without us knowing everything and without us controlling everything. We are alive. The naked trees out there is alive. The lake is alive with wind and gratitude fill us, fill our heart. So in so many, many ways, it is right and it is good to use the word we and us. We all want to be happy. We don't want to suffer. We want to be free and at peace. We want to belong. And in so many, many ways, we do belong to one another and to the planet. But some of what's happening around us are hard stuff. And I wonder if our we can include those people and beings. Do we inadvertently throw any beings out of our heart? I read that one, so far, one in 500 Americans died of COVID since the first reported infection. When I first read it, I, I couldn't believe it. I thought it's too high, one in 500? I mean, it's not like billions. 500 is graspable concept. <clears throat> so I did the math. 766,000 deaths out of the population of 31.4 million. And that's 0 0.0024. It is one in 500. And I hope it's not going to be one in 400 or 300. And this number doesn't include those who suffer from long-term health impacts of COVID or from its economic impacts or the kids and families impacted by the school closing. And one of us may not be here a year from now, but that could be me. According to Al Jazeera, in Minnesota, police killing have actually increased since George Floyd. And let's not even talk about Kyle Rittenhouse. My heart hurts to know about tens and thousands of refugees at both sides of the US-Mexico border. And if the refugees are black, such as those from Haiti. They have been treated differently by ICE. I personally know of two Haitian asylum seekers who crossed the border earlier in the summer. <clears throat> For five years since they left Haiti, they travel through South and Central America, often on foot and eking out the living whenever they could. And though they entered the U.S. legally asking for asylum, they are threatened with deportation. Many Haitian refugees say to be sent back to Haiti is worse than death, and I, I believe them. <clears throat> Here's a hard one. The United Nations recently reported that at least 400,000 Yemeni children under five will die of starvation this year. Can my heart take this knowing? And they, our children too, and I am afraid my heart breaks too much and I won't be able to function. 
So let's all breathe. California wildfire reached the edge of Sequoia Grove this summer. The fire threatened to kill even some of the most fire adaptive ancient trees. You know, they grow to be over 200 feet tall and many are thousands of years old. What would happen when their crown is burned through destroying the sea forever for the future growth? A couple of months ago, when it was still like summer, I visited a friend's cabin in the pristine north. The leaves of the birch trees had already turned yellow and scant. Drought's killing them, my friend said sadly. And then she had to remove her precious possessions from the cabin because the wildfire was encroaching just 10 miles away. Even here in the land of 10,000 lakes, fires and droughts threaten us. And I'm sure you have your own list of hard knowing, and some may be very personal. Our heart hurts, our belly contracts with worries, our neck strains with longings. Our limbs may feel numb with helplessness. And these are really uncomfortable feelings and sensations. The mind may react by rationalizing. It may legit legitimize the reason to minimize the depth of suffering of these beings of ours. Or the mind incessantly asks, what can I do? What can I do? And my own discomfort right now urges me that I should quickly pivot my talk and towards hope and relief. Do you all want that? <laughs> <clears throat> And to reassure you with some easy steps, and in fact, there are actually some easy steps, but I'm not ready to go there yet, and to comfort you. And I'm resisting those urges because the urge at the surface comes from my habit reaction of wanting to avoid the unpleasant, the unpleasantness of the feelings themselves, the fear of disappointing you or being judged by you. Instead, I ask myself, what is the truth beneath these urges? Reverend Angel Frodo Williams, a black and queer Zen, Zen teacher said, the body is the arbiter of truth. The body is the arbiter of truth. So I bring presence to the center of my quivering body. And this attentiveness immediately has an effect, it calms it. What is the reality of this moment if not distracted by my grasping for comfort. What significant insight is lost if I don't lean into the discomfort as a step towards realizing the Bodhisattva bow as a portal to liberation? I stay in my body. I bring my presence to the breath. And I invite you to do the same. Let's breathe, breathe together for a moment. And bear with me in this discomfort and pain. 
So I am not alone, and so you are not alone. An eco-activist asked Thich Nhat Hanh, the Zen master, I think most of us know him well. <clears throat> he asked, what's the most important thing we can do? What shall we do? Shall we sit on the cushion and meditate? Shall we climb on the barricade and fight for justice and change? In knowing the suffering in the world and in us, our reflective question is, what shall we do? Do I do this or do I do that? As if the options pull us in opposite direction and that being pulled in opposite direction sometimes itself painful. We feel that familiar split and the split adds to the discomfort and agitation. And we are really tempted to turn away or tune out. What's the most important thing we can do for the sake of life on earth, for the sake of all beings? And Thich Nhat Hanh answered, what we most need to do is to hear within ourselves the sounds of the cry of the earth. Hear the cries of the earth, of the world. Hear it inside of you. So the Zen master's response cuts through the dualism in the question. He invites us to lean into the raw, seamless experience of what is here. And mediated by the mind's wish for things to be different than what it is. We can't know our most authentic and compassionate response until we slow down and hear the cries inside our own being. Hear within ourselves the cry of the earth of our relatives, of our own heart hurting. You know, in America, we live in a world created by the consequences of not listening. So to be willing to stop and listen to the body, to the earth crying, is a radical and courageous act an act of love. And it does go against the strong grain of our cultural condition. To amble through our suffering as a portal to awakening really takes courage. We never know what is beyond that portal until we go through it. Wilkie <clears throat> wrote, be patient towards all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the question themselves. Wilkie, the German poet. And actually it was Joanna Macy, the renowned translator of Wilkie's poems and the 92-year-old activist, author, and Buddhist scholar, who actually told the story of Thich Nhat Hanh in a recent documentary video. In it, she exclaims, quote, the bodies on earth are being traumatized. Of course we feel it in our own bodies. It arises from our profound caring our caring is grounded in the interconnectedness of all life. 
We hurt because we care. And this caring is one knowing we can claim as our truth. When we ground ourselves in that, something rises above our pain and our fear. Recently, I heard a moving Dharma talk by Jisho Sarah Siebert, a Zen teacher and social justice activist about her experience in Haiti. <clears throat> And, and uh, her, she talked about her experience 10 years ago, right after the first earthquake, when things were horrible and things haven't been improved in Haiti. So she said, quote, there was a time when I was walking down the road in Haiti. I'd been living there for some time and things were really hard. I didn't have a lot of support. I didn't have a lot of food. I was really having a, a difficult time in my daily life. There's a very felt history of slavery and colonialism in Haiti and present day understanding of their economic exploitation by outsiders. So as a white person, I dug myself out of a bottomless pit in trying to make new relationship. Just keep digging every day. I remember walking down the road and all these Haitian people were shouting things at me and shouting things at me and shouting things at me. I just wanted to sit down in the middle of the road and just not want it to go on. And Jisha halted speak, end of quote. Jisha halted speaking momentarily here. And I thought what she was going to say next was like she collapsed on the road with despair or was overwhelmed. What should she do? Should she give up and humbly accept her limits? Should she grit her teeth and continue the struggle? This is what she said. Quote, I was going along and try to greet people, even if it's just a brief interaction, something positive, but I just didn't have it. So I stopped. She stopped. She continued. And the strangest thing happened. I just felt this top of my head open and I felt this incredible rush of energy that didn't come from me. And I felt it go down the bottom of my feet and I looked around and I didn't have to do anything. And I kept walking and it felt so different. I felt so intertwined with that place. I felt so intertwined with that place. Jisho commented that what happened was nothing rational or logical. When she opened herself fully to what was happening inside of her and around her, her sense of separate and suffering self somehow dissolved. Something opened her heart wide and she felt the sense of connection to the land and its people, their suffering, their small daily joys, their resilience. And she too was all that. New energy that did not come from the self, she said infused her entire body and renewed her. She said that a universal being awakening, this is a quote, a universal being of awakening is accessible absolutely every moment and in every space, end of quote. <clears throat> so this brings us to a full circle 
that right in the middle of sorrow and anguish, greed and hatred, in the seemingly merciless and mixed up world, there is also always so much kindness, generosity and resilience, joy and release, a promise of liberation, always there. So the vaccines against COVID have become available in an unprecedented speed. The pandemic woke us to the fallacy of normalcy and to realize what really matters in our life. The Minneapolis residents have done their earnest soul searching and they voted for what they believe will bring best public safety. So tens and thousands of Yemeni children will still die from starvation. Countless NGOs and governments have been sending massive humanitarian aid to Yemen. Adrienne Marie Brown, an activist and author said, even if there's nothing I can do in this moment, there's been so many moments like that. She said, even then, I can light a candle on my altar to hold them in my heart, but still not throw them out of my heart. I found that really inspiring. And you know, on my way to my friends up north in the cabin, I saw dozens and dozens of small tents and mobile shower units along the road. And they belonged to the firefighters. And they were fighting 24 seven to put that fire down. And my colleagues and I got to know the two Haitian friends. And we have been in awe of how they survived so long with so little and without losing hope. In her poem, Wayne, Jane Hirschfield writes, so few grains of happiness measured against all the dark and still the full balance. Still the scales balance. To each of the 10,000 sorrows, there is simultaneous joys and reliefs when we open our heart wide enough to include the fullness of life. Delusion is created when we believe only one side holds the truth or that they are static. We have seen that they are in constant flux. Pain turns to healing. Joy turns to new sorrow. Oppression gives rise to justice. We can't dismiss or ignore any experience, any being in any moment. Because they make up our we. Sometimes when my heart trembles, I ground myself in front of my home altar, which has two beautiful statues. One is a Buddha in the mudra of touching the earth at the moment of his enlightenment. And I always think that how striking, how astounding it is that the Buddha didn't ask for heavens for support when he was challenged by Mara, the force of greed, hatred, and delusion. Instead, he touched the earth. He asked the earth to bear witness to his rightful place for liberation. 
And the other statue is a statue of Kwanin, the Bodhisattva of mercy, some people would say. And this statue I have has uncommon features. It's uh, made of really delicate, beautiful white porcelain. And she sits cross-legged on a lotus uh, base, which is on um, a tusked white elephant. And on the left hand, she holds um, long, two long stems of lotus. And when I see the lotus, I hear Tiknahan's gata, no mud, no lotus. And her right hand is in Abhaya Mudra, the mudra of no fear. And I see the Mahapajapati is also doing this. You can try it. This is mudra of no fear. So mudra is a symbolic gesture of the hands and fingers used in Buddhist and Hindu ceremonial acts and art. Um, I invite you to try it if you feel like it because your energy shift. So raise your right hand upright, palm facing outside, and you just make the Abhaya Mudra, the Mudra of fearlessness, right? So seeing the Kuan Yin with the raised right hand in the Mudra of fearlessness, then I saw in my mind's eye the Chinese character the Kuan Yin, or in Japanese, in Japanese, Kanzeon, Kanzeon, the one who hears the cries of the world. And so the Kuan Yin of my altar whispers to my quivering heart, don't be afraid when you hear the cries of the world. Hear it inside of you. Hear deeply and let your heart break. And your heart can stay open. And your mind can become steady. And when I do what she beseeches me, love that does not belong to me, but boundless love to which I, we, belong, fills me. And like Jisho, who felt so intertwined with the place, when I dare to keep my heart open, even as I feel the pain of its breaking, something larger and deeper knowing steadies me, and I'm buoyed by it. The fearless right hand of the Kuan Yin reminds me that I have agency and to use it fearlessly for the benefit of all beings. When I do that, the next small step leads me that I can take, the next small step that I can take with my agency will be revealed. And yeah, it's a small knowing that goes actually a long way, touching my 37 trillion cells and radiate out to the galaxy with 200 billion galaxies. So I want to end by quoting the last line in uh, Jane Hirschfield's poem. Jane Hirschfield is an ordained Zen uh, priest and a renowned poet. She says in the poem, the world asks of us only the strength we have and we give it. Then it asks more and we give it. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you have any questions since I have no answers. But <laughs> if you have um, 
comments, or if you, especially if you have your own stories to share, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you. That means a lot. I want to acknowledge your courage. Um, and those in America, uh, I don't look like you can do it. So, they're there. I've been here for many years, but uh, I'm grateful to Japan and um, being American. So you said that the kind of inner peace can be accessed at any moment. And sometimes I feel as though there are maybe like stretches of time, three days or three weeks or three months, where you kind of go with this like baselessness and you don't really have like a conception of levity or light or anything. And so to me when I'm in those moments it, it feels like I really don't have access to that. But then I guess when I think about it, not when I'm thinking about it, <laughs> um, little things peek through, maybe that kind of uh, contrast that sort of ruminatory place. And maybe it's just you focus more on those things and you just kind of then really see that, that, um, that darkness or that negativity isn't really all-consuming, and you said something about those little grains of hope up against the swath of this evil or whatever, and, and so maybe it's, it's, all, it's kind of incumbent upon us to uh, open those up and then magnify those as opposed to letting this kind of sort of seemingly all-powerful wave of negativity take us over, I guess. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you all know, all know Rick Hansen? He's a neuropsychologist and a Buddhist meditation teacher. And one of the things he says, or he discovered scientifically, is that for the sake of survival, our brain is conditioned to actually notice the negative. Because when we notice negative, then we try to avoid it and that ensure our physical survival. And we are not really conditioned to notice those moments like that, that you talked about. 
And so it's um, also good to train ourselves to notice the small good, small generosity act that, you know, sometimes we do and we dismiss it and, and count it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I want to say that uh, I'm feeling very raw right now from this experience. Mm -hmm. I heard the crying of the earth, as you said, and the breaking of my heart for that, and for that I'm grateful because that's what I'm right now so that's nice to be able to remember that and look into that space that to look into that space that the darkness opens up investigation of its true nature. And you're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I wonder the stories experiences of ourselves and our cultural experience on this planet and our personal pain or ancestral pain. Do you think that's conclusive? Or do you see that as another gateway to pass through? I think nothing is conclusive. Okay. We can't conclude anything. We know so little. And all we know is what's available right here, right now, which is really small. And so, we want some conclusion, right? Because it gives us false um, idea that right. then now, if I know that, so then I can predict, you know? Um, I don't think it's conclusive. And so our task is, no matter how hard it is, to stay open when we can. And some days we just can't. Then we give ourselves some break and kindness and we rest. And life goes on. But somehow your question comes to mind. I, I didn't say this in my talk, you know, like the theory of evolution that seems conclusive. You know, the survival of the fittest seems so conclusive. And, and yet, there's been more and more research um, biologists making findings that um, how the trees communicate in with the mycelium underground and that um, the mother tree um, communicate and they protect and and so there is a collaborative aspect not just survival of the fittest but we survive when we collaborate and we've been finding out more and more of that. So nothing is conclusive. Yeah, that's I was thinking about that when you talked about the thirty seven trillion cells and how there's also another thirty seven trillion cells in bacteria uh -huh. fungi that are inside and on our body. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, There's a whole universe here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
information. Yeah. It's always in flux. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How are we doing with time? Thank you.